So, welcome everyone to the next talk. Oh, Ami is uh, taking about even some or some uh, data science libraries. He's talking about making scikit-learn running on top of pandas. So, please welcome Ami and enjoy the talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd like to talk about a library for making uh, scikit-learn run on top of uh, pandas. Uh, my name is Amit Avori from uh, Facebook uh, Research, and uh, this work was done together with Shachar uh, Azulai and Tari uh, Sadka. So to begin the obvious question, uh, why do we really need to make these two libraries talk to each other? So I'll show three examples where uh, using them uh, separately leads into some uh, troubles. And I'll start off with an example which is actually taken from uh, scikit-learn's own uh, documentation, where uh, we take uh, two matrices, uh, x0 and x1, and concatenate them. Uh, it's here in code, and I'll, it's here in a diagram, and I'll show it in code too. We take uh, two matrices, x0 and x1, and, con and concatenate them. And then uh, we send off the result into a concatenation of uh, select k best, which will choose the best uh, feature, and also to PCA, which will reduce the features. And uh, following that, we'll take the outcome and send it off. Uh, we'll make a pipeline sending it off to a random forest uh, regressor. And then uh, we can uh, use it just like a normal uh, estimator, right? Uh, we can call a fit and predict and whatever. And if we uh, run this, then we're going to see uh, lots of numbers in arrays. So for example, x0 is just a series of uh, numbers, right? And uh, x1 is also just a bunch of numbers. And their concatenation is also a bunch of numbers. And if we ask the predictor to tell us what were the future importances, we'll also just get basically a bunch of uh, numbers. And that's a bit of a problem, because it's a bit hard to interpret what these numbers uh, mean. So looking, for example, at the uh, feature importances which the predictor has told us, so what do these numbers mean even? Like the 0, 1, 0, 3, and 0, 7, to which, to which uh, attributes in the original data do they, do they correspond at all? And given that uh, one of the uh, stages used in the middle was uh, select k best, so from which column did it come at all? And, and did it even come from x0 or x1? It's very hard to understand uh, what, what went on here in, in retrospect. What's worse even is that it's not only uh, sometimes difficult to interpret the results, it's sometimes difficult to make the pipelines run the correct way without metadata. So um, a, one case which I've actually encountered is that the previous example is formed on the training where x0 and x1 are taken from two separate databases and concatenated uh, together and then sent on. And after the model is uh, trained, when we deploy it, then it comes in a completely different way. We get this x, uh, say, from the internet on, in real time, and then, then we uh, predict uh, based on that. And since uh, sklearn st steps will just check for the correct dimensions, they don't check for anything else, if we've made a mistake and the order of the columns is wrong now and uh, we've trained on one thing and we're trying to predict on something else, then sklearn uh, won't, won't be aware of that even, and we might get garbage results. And I'm slightly as ashamed to say that this is a bug I've actually done, uh, done in the past, and it's uh, sometimes difficult to... Uh, it's sometimes difficult to find out what's going wrong after that. Um, now the second problem uh, is uh, what happens when we want in the middle of an sklearn uh, pipeline to perform uh, munging of the, of the type that Pandas does very well. So here's the classic example of a user uh, movie rating uh, prediction system. This table is taken from an actual uh, field experiment I've done on my uh, three daughters where I asked them to uh, uh, grade uh, Frozen, Mulan, and uh, Shrek, which are their favorite uh, movies. And uh, in this uh, specific example, uh, what we're going to do is to take uh, this X and to feed it into a grid search uh, CV, which at each outer fold uh, does non negative matrix uh, factorization and sends off the results into a random forest uh, regressor. So the problem is that it's very nice to have a stage called uh, NMF, and sklearn has one, but the, the input to NMF and the output to NMF don't match what, don't match what we have. In order to perform the negative matrix factorization, what we need to do is to take the original uh, matrix. And uh, the original matrix has, uh, for each row, a pair of a user and a movie. And then we need to pivot it. And uh, we pivot it in a way that one dimension has the users and the other has uh, the movies. And only at this point can we do the non-negative uh, matrix factorization, which uh, breaks it up into two pairs of columns, latent factors for the movies and the users. 
At this point, we need to go back to the original uh, uh, data set and concatenate it. And after we, move, uh, after we merge it, then uh, only the last four columns here are the ones which we can use on for the next stage of the pipeline, which is the random forest uh, regressor. And that's a bit of a problem because uh, sklearn is great, but sklearn doesn't really do that stuff well. It doesn't uh, do uh, pivots and merges and, and concatenations. It's, it's not really built for that thing. And um, in some sense, it's unnatural to, st to send the stuff even to, to sklearn because if you look at the user and the movie columns, they're not really data. They, they are me metadata. In fact, the way that they're written here, um, sklearn can, can't even accept them because they are strings and it has to work on uh, numerical attributes. So there are ways of getting around that. But what I'm trying to show is that it, it's really unnatural to, to try to shove this down, uh, down sklearn uh, directly. The last problem, which is a bit orthogonal to the, the first two, is that when you combine uh, estimators, uh, things tend to be quite uh, verbose. So again, uh, referring to the example from sklearn's documentation, uh, suppose uh, we would like to concatenate select k best, best and uh, PCA, and then pipeline the result into a random forest regressor. Then this is basically the code that they recommend to do. And in my opinion, this is a bit, a bit too long, and, and you need to read it a bit too much to understand what's going on here for something that is actually pretty, pretty simple. Like you'd want to play around faster with this in a notebook. So the main idea is that uh, we can use uh, lots of stuff that's already uh, written. Uh, we just need to glue around some, some things that people did before. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that if you try to think of a NumPy uh, array, uh, which has uh, metadata for the columns and the rows, then of course there is such a thing already. It's basically a, pa a pandas uh, data frame. So uh, if we look at the left, then we see the, uh, the famous iris data set, but on the right it's much uh, clearer. We know that the first column is the uh, sepal uh, length and uh, so on, and, and we can also see here in the indices that they don't have any special meaning, that, that it's just uh, an enumeration of the instances uh, that we have. Uh, the second thing we have at the disposal is that the ability or actually the notation to take a stage and to pipe it on into the next stage and so on is something that's been done for uh, 50 years, I think, in, uh, in Unix-like uh, pipelines using uh, the shell operator. So there's no reason not to borrow that, that idea, too. So in the next uh, two sections, I'll uh, try to describe the interface and the implementation of IBEX, which is a library we, we've written uh, in order to take these uh, things to our advantage. And I'll start with the interface. So the interface uh, is basically composed of uh, two layers. There's a lower uh, layer which uh, shouldn't be used uh, that often and a higher level. But to begin with the lower level, it uh, is very small. The core library just uh, contains a mixin and an uh, adapter. And it works in this uh, often. If we take any sklearn uh, compliant uh, stage, for example, uh, linear regression, which is one of the stages uh, from sklearn, and we apply the frame function to it, so what it will do is to write on the fly a new class. And uh, this class derives both from the original class and from a mixin class, which makes it uh, aware of uh, pandas. And now if uh, we use this new class uh, instead, this adapter class, then it is aware of uh, pandas. So for one thing, it, can t it takes only pandas entities. It doesn't take any more NumPy arrays. It takes only pandas entities, but it also outputs pandas entities as well. So for example, if x is a, is a data frame with the indices, uh, with the row indices 0, 1, and 2, and so is y, and uh, we train the predictor on uh, these two things, and then we ask them to, it to predict x, then it'll output for us a uh, pandas series with the indices 0, 1, and 2, indicating that those are the series uh, that the person who meant to do the, the predict uh, meant. This might give some, uh, some meaning to someone who's looking at the result. And also in terms of awareness of uh, columns, if we have uh, X, which is a pandas data frame with the columns A and B, and uh, Y, and suppose uh, we train uh, the model on X and Y, but now we feed in, we feed in, uh, we feed in uh, X with the columns uh, transposed, okay? The, the order has changed, uh, X, B, and A. So since logically uh, any permutation of the columns of a pandas data frame uh, don't, don't really change it, then the library is aware of it. So you don't, need to, you don't need to make sure anymore that the columns are ordered exactly the right way uh, they were originally. The, the library is smart enough to figure it out. And if we put in x with the columns transposed, we will get the same output as before. 
But conversely, if we try to, uh, to train a model on x, which is indexed by i, j, k, and by y, which is indexed by something else, by the numbers 21, 22, and 23, then uh, it won't let it happen. It'll say, you know, you probably made an error because there's no, there's no real meaning to predict, uh, to train on something that has two different indices. And in the same way, suppose we have uh, x, which has uh, the columns a and b, and we train the model on x and y, and then we try to input x1, which has different uh, columns. It doesn't have a and b anymore, but it has m and n, and we say, what's your prediction for m and n? Then it'll throw an exception and uh, tell us, uh, you know, um, I, don't, I don't understand what's the data you've given me. So this adds uh, some more meta metadata and makes operations uh, more safe to perform and more interpretable, and it doesn't really uh, sacrifice efficiency to do that. The second thing that wrapping does, which again makes, uh, makes a class that is derived from the original class and uh, from uh, the mix-in, is to allow different ways of combining operators, uh, combining estimators. So for example, uh, in sklearn, in order to pipeline one, uh, one estimator into the other, then you would uh, use uh, make pipeline, for example. So uh, optionally, if you use this library, you can just use the pipe, just like the Unix uh, shell. So if you use a frame PCA, you can just try to pipe into frame random forest regressor. That in itself makes a pipeline. And again, optionally, if you would like to concatenate uh, two stages, um, then uh, you can use the plus. So instead of using make union, you can use a uh, frame of select k best plus frame of uh, PCA. And of course, uh, you can combine these things together. So going back to the example from before, uh, if we would like to concatenate, concatenate select k best and uh, PCA and to pipe this in into a random forest regressor, then we just can write it like this. It's, it's the plus of the first two piped into the last one. Uh, at least personally, to me, this seems uh, much more concise and it's more fun to play around in a notebook with, with stuff like that. When we take these things uh, together, then, then things work even uh, better. So again, returning to the classic uh, IRIS uh, data set. Suppose we, ha we have the original uh, data, which now has metadata of the sepal length, uh, sepal width, and uh, so on and so on. And now let's uh, create a, tr a transformer, which is the concatenation of uh, PCA, which is supposed to take two elements. And select k best, we're telling it to choose only the single best k element. And now, uh, if we uh, run this uh, through the concatenation, then we get a hierarchical uh, data frame, which is something that Pandas is very good uh, at doing. So we can see that the result of this is a PCA composed of, the, of component zero and component one. And the last column is uh, select k best, and here we have the information of which column it chose. It chose uh, paddle length. So the more complex uh, combinations you do, then, then the more informative the result uh, is going uh, to be, because Pandas is, is really good at all of these uh, multi-indexing uh, stuff. Um, finally, in some cases, like the one we've seen uh, before with uh, doing the NMA for the uh, uh, movie uh, ra rating uh, prediction, um, you can just write a, a pipeline, uh, I'm sorry, you can just write a stage uh, on your own. So if you would like to write a, a user movie transformer, for example, all you need to do is to subclass yourself the uh, frame uh, mix-in of which I've uh, discussed uh, earlier in line three. And just by doing that, you get something that looks very similar to an sklearn uh, step, but it is pandas aware. So for example, here, uh, if we define in line uh, five uh, def fit, and it takes uh, self x and y, so now x and y are pandas entities. So we can do all the usual nice uh, munging stuff that, uh, that pandas does. And if we combine it uh, with, uh, with other steps, then, then everything will uh, just uh, work automatically. Okay, so that is the, uh, that is the lower uh, level. It's sometimes uh, necessary to use it, but not often. Uh, in the higher level, the, the library basically uh, wraps on its own uh, sklearn, uh, xgboost, and uh, TensorFlow uh, Keras at the moment. If, if more libraries uh, become useful to us or to anyone else contributing, we'll, we'll be happy to add it. So what's the reason for this? Uh, as I've shown before, it's possible to take any sklearn uh, compliant uh, stage and to use the frame operator to make it pandas aware. So we can take select k best and call uh, frame on it, and take a linear regression and call frame on it. And, and each time we can call frame, however repeatedly doing uh, this uh, frame frame thing uh, can, can become very annoying. Um, and uh, in order to save this, since, since these libraries are so well established, then, uh, then the library automatically pre-wraps uh, pre uh, these three major libraries. So just by changing the, the import, instead of uh, importing 
sklearn linear model linear regression, if you import IBEX sklearn linear model, then linear regression will be already uh, the stage which you ex expect, but pre-wrapped uh, to be pandas aware. And the same is true of, uh, of XGBoost and of uh, uh, TensorFlow Keras. So uh, that is basically the interface of the library. Now, in terms of the implementation, it's, it's not very complicated. I just wanted, if, if there is time, to uh, mention some technical points. So the obvious uh, straightforward uh, way of, of writing such an adapter is through uh, composition. So what we would do is uh, to write a wrapper class. And uh, this uh, wrapper class uh, would take, uh, for example, in this case, base estimator regressor mixin in the case that it's a regressor and IBEX's own frame mixin to say that it's pandas aware. And inside it would hold uh, wrapped, which is the original uh, stage, which is it's wrapping as a member. And then things would work as follows. If the user uh, calls, uh, for example, predict, then it would call the wrapper. The wrapper would validate uh, X. It would check uh, that the uh, rows and the columns uh, match already what it learned in the, in the fit stage. And then it would strip this metadata and turn it into a NumPy uh, entity. And uh, then it would take the stripped down version, which is just NumPy, and send it over to the wrapped uh, entity. Then the wrapped entity would uh, return the prediction, which is uh, YT. And again, the wrapper would add the met metadata. In this case, it would take, uh, for example, the row indices and, and create a pandas series. And finally, it would take this wrapped uh, entity and return it back to the user. So th that's the basic uh, way we would like to do things. Unfortunately, it's not exactly possible uh, to do this for a number of reasons. For the first of which is that sklearn is, is a tremendously huge uh, library. I've drawn here a, a D3 visualization of of the various uh, stages and, and models of sklearn. There are quite many of them. Uh, it's not possible to do it by hand, and, and moreover, it's actually impossible uh, to do it because it's constantly changing. Each version of sklearn adds more modules, uh, more uh, stages, moves things around, and actually even removes things. So it's not possible to write on one computer a version and then ship it out and hope that on a different computer the uh, things will be exactly the same. So instead, what, uh, what we've opted to do is to use a dynamic uh, loading, which is a bit of a nice technique uh, in terms of Python now. This, this, the rest basically has very little to do with machine learning. It's, it's now basically about Python. So um, something I, I didn't know a while back is that if you uh, write something like um, import IBEX sklearn uh, linear model, like you, you do import something dot something dot something, then what the runtime will do is uh, create a series of imports. It'll do import IBEX, which is the first one. And following that, it will call import IBEX sklearn. So now it's doing the second import. And at this point, uh, our code is going to intercept this and is going to uh, register uh, sys uh, metapath. Now, sys metapath is another uh, sort of cool thing where you can uh, go to the runtime and say, I have a class, and uh, from this point on, uh, anything that matches a certain pattern when you do an import, then I, I'd like uh, this class to take uh, care of it. So we register the class with sysmetapath, and now, now when uh, the runtime says, okay, but what the user really wanted was to import IBEX uh, sklearn linear model, so it, it needs to write linear model. It just writes it on the fly. And the way it does, is, uh, the way it does this is it goes over to sklearn's linear model, and it asks it for the directory of its contents, and it returns uh, all the classes and functions and, and globals and whatever are part of the model. And uh, at this point, this is all happening on the fly when you just import stuff. Uh, we uh, go over uh, the list of things that are, have been uh, returned, and we call inspect. And inspect is also a nice model, which allows uh, to take entities and to ask all sorts of stuff about them. Um, is this thing a class? Does it uh, subclass this specific class? Uh, does it contain uh, this uh, member? And, and so on. And once we know uh, what are the things we're supposed to wrap, then we wrap it on the fly and write the model on the fly and then, then uh, load it as, a, as an import. So that takes uh, care of, uh, of huge libraries like sklearn. It's not, not uh, necessary to do it at, at when you're shipping it out, but rather at runtime. Then uh, the second out of uh, three problems is that uh, scikit-learn uh, scikit apparently has all sorts of uh, restrictions and uh, idiosync idiosyncrasies. Uh, the first is that it absolutely will uh, refuse uh, to take a constructor which uh, doesn't completely specify the, the arguments. If you try to write 
uh, something that takes uh, args and kw args and say at runtime I'll figure it out. Uh, if you try to use this, then a runtime will throw an exception and say that, that sklearn is, is unwilling uh, to do this. Um, and the second thing is that um, uh, sklearn has a state dependent uh, properties, meaning that uh, if you look at linear, for linear uh, uh, regression, uh, for example, then it has a coef member, but this coef member doesn't even exist until, until you call fit on it. So it's not possible to statically analyze the class and see what are the members. So um, we've solved this in all sorts of uh, ways of local classes. Uh, this, uh, there are all sorts of details which I think are uh, interesting in terms of uh, serialization. But um, as the time is running out, I'll, I'll just uh, skip to the conclusion. So um, we've written a library which utilizes uh, pandas uh, meta metadata, and that gives us interpretability, safety, and allows us to do data munging uh, as a more natural part of uh, sklearn pipelines. Um, it allows to do things which are more index aware, uh, stacking, nested cross validation, and so on. These things uh, really need uh, metadata inside uh, to work uh, the right way. And uh, the more you do a combination of these things, I think the more apparent that something like this is uh, needed. However, we've actually written uh, very little uh, code. This, this library is just a few hundred lines, which basically is a mediator between uh, sklearn and pandas. And in this respect, it might be similar to, to later generation uh, visualization libraries like uh, Seaborn, which uh, give a pandas interface, but, uh, but really operate on top of uh, mat, matplotlib. So in the same, case, in the same uh, reasoning, there's no uh, reason to write a whole new uh, machine learning uh, library. We can just use uh, sklearn, which is an excellent uh, library. Um, there were a few technical things we, we've seen, uh, sysmetapath, uh, dir, and inspect. Um, this library is uh, ready for use. Uh, you'll, um, you're, you're very, very welcome uh, to use it, to contribute to it, uh, participate in it, file bugs, uh, whatever. I, I think it's really time uh, to, have these, uh, to have these two great libraries, sklearn and, and pandas, uh, talking to each other. And really, if any of you wants to, to be involved in this, uh, even as a user, we'll be extremely uh, grateful. And thank you also for your uh, time now. Thank you for the great talk, Ami. So are there any questions in the plenum? Uh, a few months ago, I had a, a pandas a data frame and wanted to, to just input it into sklearn and uh, do some stuff. And I exactly had this problem that is now solved with the lower layer, as you call it. So I'm asking, why didn't I find it back then? And Secondly, why, why did you create this library and not uh, just make uh, sklearn behave in that only reasonable way, in my opinion? Mm. Um, okay, so, so if I understand the question is uh, why write a separate li library and not just uh, fork sklearn? Uh, would, that, would that be correct? Mm, maybe not fork, but uh, just uh, improve sklearn to, to work on pandas directly. Um, Okay, so, so that's an excellent question. I think that sklearn is uh, a massive library with, I, I don't know, maybe hundreds of very talented people uh, working on it, and um, uh, it would be a bit presumptuous for me to try to uh, change it directly. And I think that, um, I think also that because of its size, it, uh, it tends to be conservative, which is a good, a good thing. They're, uh, they're very reticent about adding new things because uh, they think that uh, they should take the time to see how things work out. I, I think they're, they're making excellent decisions. But in my opinion, doing a change like this in sklearn, which, which moreover is not backward compatible. I mean, what I have here is, uh, what, what I showed here is something which allows you simultaneously to, learn, to use a classic sklearn and this version of sklearn. They don't clash with each other. You can continue using both of them. We're saying let's, let's change sklearn so it breaks backward uh, compatibility. Uh, it's something you probably need uh, a guy like uh, Guido van uh, Rossum, uh, you know, to go and say, now we're doing uh, uh, Python uh, uh, 3, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's greater than the width of my soldiers and my bad, bad English. Uh, that, that's the reason, basically.
Yeah, uh, thank you for sharing this information. And I have a question. Do you know some drawbacks, performance, memory, whatever, about uh, this approach? Right. That, that is a, an excellent question. What, is, uh, what happens to uh, performance? So uh, actually, I, uh, I timed lots of stuff. And uh, I think that like anything involving uh, Pandas, your, your mileage may uh, vary. So let's think what's happening here, really. Uh, uh, when you perform uh, any operation, like doing uh, linear, even linear regression, not to mention uh, trees or, or something like that, then uh, you are doing something that is super linear. So adding uh, a linear stage where you're copying your data into a NumPy array, uh, it probably won't uh, affect the time at all, unless you're doing it in really, really tiny ma matrices. So like if you have a really massive uh, data set and, uh, and you want to run a tree-based regressor and you're using this, I don't think you will see any time difference uh, whatsoever. But if in a tight loop you want to run a million times a uh, forest of like three instances, then yeah, you could have a huge uh, performance hit. I happen to think that the, la the latter case is not that, that interesting. Uh, in terms of memory, I think that's a very complicated question. I've, I've for years been wondering what exactly is uh, Pandas' impact on, uh, on memory. So on the one hand, whenever each uh, stage here uh, takes the data, it doesn't need to make a copy of the data. So you are, at certain points, increasing, uh, increasing probably by twice the, uh, the data. But uh, on the other hand, uh, Pandas itself uh, has uh, fewer constraints on how to store uh, memory, because uh, in NumPy, it's basically a buffer interface. It has to store things consecutively in memory. Whereas Pandas is much more flexible. In fact, it has to be because it's not constrained to use uh, homogeneous data types. So I think that if you're looking at a big uh, pipeline and, uh, and things are stored there in, in uh, Pandas along the way, and at each, uh, certain, uh, at, at each uh, specific point you're copying just one of them uh, and making it into, into another thing and then trans transforming it back into Pandas, then it's hard to say. I, I think that at worst uh, it'll uh, double your memory, but there's also a chance that it'll uh, decrease your, your memory costs as well. But I think that's an excellent uh, point. Okay, depending on how exhausted your answer is, uh, we have one or two questions oh, left. Sorry. No problem, very nice. Uh, thanks, that was great. And this, this project looks great. Just a, a quick question. So you showed a great chart in D3. You're probably familiar with uh, blocks where yes. people can show these like kind of complete code samples. I wonder if you've thought about making it easy to share pipelines written in this way where it's clear to understand what's going on, but you know, solve that, that iris problem using like these algorithms or, or you know, like create these sort of recipes because you know, customer lifetime value or churn and those kinds of things are often you're repeating the same steps. So sort of creating these canonical examples using this this framework that people can just go use as recipes. Um, yeah, so I think that's a, also an excellent uh, suggestion, but, but uh, it is also larger than the scope of uh, this project, because if to generalize it, uh, it would be, uh, why not make a repository where people could uh, share uh, IPython uh, notebooks, in a sense, uh, which is an excellent idea. But I, th I think that there are such uh, places. For example, uh, GitHub has become very good at just rendering IPYMB files. So you just write them and, and put them there, and it'll render them on the fly. Um, and also, there used to be something called NB, NB, some NB convert uh, sort of hosting service, but, uh, but I would trust uh, GitHub uh, more at, uh, at this point. But having said that, uh, I, think, I think, yeah, that sharing notebooks is a really good way to, to do stuff. OK, we have time for one more question. If there are no more.